What would your life be like? What would it look like if you 10 x your income? If you were making 10 times more money right now, would you live in the place you're living in now? Would you educate your children the way you're educating them now? Would you take care of your parents the way you take care of them now or other aging loved ones? Or would you do something completely different? Would your vacation still consist of getting in the car and driving for two days to a state that's two, states, that's two days away so that you can visit your in-laws? Or would you take a vacation that will create memories for you and your family for the rest of your life? What would your life look like if you 10 x your income without working harder than you're working right now? Because that's what we're going to look at today. In, um, in, in my jacket pocket or my glasses, in, in 1 Kings chapter 10, I'm going to read a verse, some verses to you, starting with verse 23. We're going to read down to verse number 27. It says, so King Solomon, and, and by the way, Solomon's name, it basically means peace. It, it, it's interesting that in English, his name is Solomon, but in Hebrew, his name is Shlomo, <laughs> which sounds like when I think of that, I think of sl slow motion. I don't know why, but I just do. Okay, anyway. Um, so King Solomon, verse 23, first Kings chapter 10, verse 23. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Now, here's, what, here's a question I have for you before I even go any further. Here's a question I have for you. If riches aren't important, why is this emphasized in the Bible? King Solomon, who was chosen by God and blessed by God, if, if like poverty is so pious, and wealth is so wicked. Why is, why is this even mentioned? Why would, it tell us, why would it tell us that he was wiser or he exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom if it wasn't important? Is that a good question? It has to be important for, on some level. I, I'm, not established, I'm not saying I know what the level is yet, but it has to be important on some level. I think one level is that both wisdom and wealth are desirable. Both wisdom and wealth are beneficial. And so King Solomon, he wasn't just wise and he wasn't just rich. He exceeded all of the other kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. And then it says, and all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. So that's a clue. That's a what? That's a clue. When God puts wisdom in your heart, people who don't have that wisdom will seek to you to learn it. You got to know something other people don't know in order to be able to do something other people can't do so you can have something other people can't have. Well, it says... And they brought every man his present vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices and horses and mules a rate year by year. And Solomon gathered together the short chariots and the horsemen and had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen um, whom he bestowed the cities uh, for chariots and with, the king of, uh, um, and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver to be as stones and cedars he made to be as sycamore trees that are in the, uh, that are in the veil for abundance. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, let me, for those of you who are already disconnected on YouTube because you're like, well, Solomon was evil and he worshiped, uh, I'm, I'm not having any arguments with any of that. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, let me give you, let me give you an understanding of my understanding of King Solomon's life. When Solomon was young, he was yielded to God and loved the Lord with all his heart. And as a result of that, God blessed him with wisdom beyond everyone and wealth beyond everyone and peace beyond any nation that had ever existed. And because what happened when Solomon became what we would call successful is he began to believe his own press. He started hearing what people were saying about him and he got started to get his significance from there and then from the significance of women and 
He started disregarding what God had said. He started disregarding what had gotten him there. And he backslid. And disregarded God and like practiced idolatry, just all kinds of weird, like, dude, like you, you are the wisest man who ever lived and now you're the wisest fool. And, and I think a lesson that we can learn from that is don't make the mistake of thinking that the benefits are the cause of the success. The success is the cause of the benefits. And what is success? To discover your purpose. The purpose for God, which God put you here. To develop yourself for that purpose. And to deploy yourself in that purpose. And as long as you are on that track, you are successful. But as soon as you de depart and detour from that purpose, you might be rich still, but you are no longer successful. And is everybody tracking? I don't want anybody to be confused by anything I'm saying. No, so beginning of his life, he's yielded to God. Middle of his life, he's backslidden as he can be. At the end of his life, he realized that the middle of his life was the part of his life that he had wasted. And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And what's the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes? If you live your life for life under the sun, if you, if you make your whole existence about life under heaven or life under the sun, you've wasted your life and tortured yourself. That's why it keeps saying all is vanity, waste, and vexation of spirit, you tortured your soul. So every, I don't want anybody to be confused. Like the part of Solomon's life we're reading about right now, model that. The part when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, follow that. But the middle of Solomon's life is a good lesson for us to know what not to do. Are y'all tracking? Okay, good. Just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So I'm going to show you what I saw that changed my life. That, that literally, like, imagine if you're making $10,000 a month right now. You go from $10,000 a month to $100,000. Or you're making, your business is doing $100,000 a month in revenue right now. You go from $100,000 a month to a million a month. Are you doing a million and you go from a million a month to $10 million a month? It's all the, sa it's all the same stuff. There, it's just a bunch of zeros. Well, how much is zero worth? Well, zero is not worth anything. Well, it depends on where you put the zero. <laughs> you put that zero in the right place, it might be worth a whole bunch. Okay. So, so. What was it about Solomon um, that gave him the ability to 10x his income? Well, before I tell you that, I'm going to tell you this. Back in 2014, when we finally got through our IRS debacle, when we got through all of, you already heard the story about how we went through seven years of difficulty. I'm not going to go into all of that. You already heard the story about how I bought a house for a million dollars in 2008, $1,027,000. Sold it for like $635,000 on a short sale borrowed money from everybody who would loan it to me to move from Pennsylvania to Florida in January of 2013 and rented a house and had to pay the first month and the last month's rent because my credit was so bad I couldn't buy a house. Um, and um, it, like I'd do a security deposit first month and last month. And all that was borrowed. And I lived on borrowed money for two years. I'm, like, I was in an uncomfortable financial situation. Okay? But in 2014, I found this whole story of Solomon, and I found it with a practical lens. And I said, wait a minute. King Solomon's the richest man who ever lived. God tells us exactly. Everybody say exactly. Exactly, exactly what his business model was. Exactly what he did. And I'm like, well, I declare, I can do that. There wasn't nothing in there from 1 Kings chapter 3 to 1 Kings chapter 10. There was nothing that was mentioned in there that I couldn't do. Guess what? There's nothing in there that you can't do. If you will do these things, can somebody pull that door closed for me, please? Yeah, if you will do those things, the things that are mentioned in 1 Kings chapter number 3 through 10, and just like, 
ask God to show it to you. I'm telling you, it'll be mind-blowing. And I'm going to tell you what the things were that I did, that, like where we, we took our weekly income and turned it, our monthly income turned into our weekly income, our mo- monthly income, our, our annual income turned into our monthly income. Took our annual income, turned it into our decade income. What? What are you talking about, bro? I'm going to show you. Okay, so what do you have to do? Well, determine who you will be as a person. Because that's where it starts. Who, like, who are you going to be? And, and so a lot of people, a lot of people don't know who they're going to be. And the reason they don't know who they're going to be is because they bought so much into their identity. And again, your identity is all of the things that all of the people your whole life told you you are not. You're not tall enough. You're not short enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You can't spell good enough. You can't run fast enough. You're not athletic enough. Blah, blah, blah. You're just not enough. Who you are is not enough. That's your identity. And, and, and what's really interesting is if you're operating from a place of identity, you can't be tapped into your purpose because you're disagreeing with God about who you are. How many of y'all tracking? And so, like, people that make fun of you or people who don't understand you or people who don't like you or people who called you names, they might even be people who are close to you. They might even have been your parents, might have been your grandparents, might have been brothers, might have been sisters, might have been coworkers, schoolwork, te- teachers, classmates, whatever. It doesn't matter. They don't know you. And so what you do is you feel the pain of the identity and try to hide in what I call a my identity. Now, what's a my identity? That's another fake identity that you created that's better than the lie identity, but it's still not you. It's the, it's the you that's always trying to prove that you're enough. Because when you recognize who you actually are, you don't need to prove anything. You can just be. Isn't that what it tells us? I'm going I'm to go board ready. So... Um, Isn't it funny that it tells us in Philippians chapter two, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind is that? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He knew who he was. But then the next thing it says is, but he made himself of no reputation. He didn't need you to know who he was in order for him to know who he was. And I promise you, you will never understand your identity if you need other people to know who you are in order for you to know who you are. See, truth doesn't require a consensus. Are y'all tracking? That's why, that's why this whole political correct cancel culture garbage is politically correct cancel culture, culture garbage. Why? Because the truth doesn't have to hide from a lie. And it doesn't need to be afraid. Like the truth doesn't have to silence a lie for people to figure out it's a lie. We can just let a lie keep talking. Eventually, everybody will know it's a lie. Right? And you keep telling the truth and it'll stay the truth. It ain't fixing to change for you, right? And so, so, who being in the form of God thought it not right to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. See, when you know who you are, you don't mind serving people. Because you don't need people to think something about you. To overcome something that other people thought about you and that you believe because they thought it and you looked up to them. How many of y'all tracking? And so we just ain't gonna do that no more. Okay, so what kind of person are you going to become? Well, here's what it says about Solomon. Here's the kind of person he was. And I said, this is the kind, I can be this kind of person. Here's what it says, 1 Kings chapter 3. Um, and Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he made an end of building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in a high place because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord in those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was a great high place. And a thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. So, a couple things we see about Solomon. Number one, um, Sol- Solomon was a person who understood the power of partnerships. Understood the power of partnerships. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. One of the greatest keys to the success that I've had in business, like to the, to the profitability and the growth of our business, is strategic partnerships. And being willing to pay partners for that partnership. What does that even mean? Like, we have affiliate partners. I didn't realize this until a couple weeks ago. I looked at it. We have 2,200 affiliates. 
My company has 2,200 people who are signed up. Now, they're not all telling the story, but 2,200 people signed up to tell the story is better than two people signed up to tell the story. <laughs> right? We send out between, generally between $30,000 and $65,000 worth of affiliate commissions a month. That's money that those partners are making for us. But not only that, David, David followed the pattern. He followed a pattern that was paternal. God has a lot to say about the whole idea of honoring parents. It's interesting that the scripture says that when God elevated Joseph in Egypt, Pharaoh looked at Joseph as a father. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? It says, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the ways of David, his father. See, Solomon didn't have to figure out the whole thing by himself. He followed a pattern that was a paternal path. Like, here's, here's, here's the reality. Unfortunately, we live in a world today where fathers are absent and where culture makes it seem like fathers are even non-essential. But there are very few things in a home that are more essential than a father. Children need a father and a mother, not just a mother, not just a father. Well, I wish I had some help in here. This is God's design. And so David was already the king. Solomon is the first successful king we see in Israel that didn't have to learn how to be a king from a heathen king. What does that even mean? Well, David served under the king of the Philistines. Saul didn't, but Saul wasn't a successful king. He was a disaster. So Solomon, but also he had a passion. He had a passion that he possessed that was, um, he, he had a passion for the Lord. It says Solomon loved the Lord. Let me ask you this. Are you a person that loves God? Like, I can't, it, it's so interesting because I, I have conversations with people and, I'm, and, and, and sometimes I feel like I'm being stubborn. But I know I'm not being stubborn, but like the conversation is making me wonder, it's making me question, am I just being stubborn? Oh no, there's a Bible principle that goes right here that says this is what I must do. I can't deviate from that just because I'm close to you. I can't deviate from that just because it's going to make you feel more comfortable. I can't not go down this path because you might be offended. Like, that, none of that's my responsibility. At the end of the day, I've got to yield to God. And that's the thing I have to, like, am I the kind of person who's willing to yield to God, or am I the kind of person who thinks that I am my own God? Well, I'm just going to do my own thing. You don't have a thing to do. You're either going to be yielded to God or you're going to be yielded to the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's no in-between. There's no my thing, your thing, his thing, her thing. No, no, no. No, you either yielded to God or you're yielded to the enemy. That's how it works. Okay. So, fast forward. Solomon, he was willing to pay the price. So, I'm going to tell you something. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you would like to have a business where people are lined up out the door around the building, cash and credit card in hand, waiting patiently to pay you? Would that be lovely? Would you like me to tell you how to have that kind of business? Everybody say yes. Okay. So before I do, let me ask you another question. What does a tree have to do to bear apples? It has to be an apple tree. What does that have to do with having people lined up around the building? Everything reproduces after its own kind. Yeah. If you want an army of happy buyers, become a happy buyer and not a resistant, irritant, I wish I could get your stuff, but keep my money buyer. <laughs> that's, too, that's too plain, ain't it? Right? Because here's the reality. Here's the reality. The reason a lot of people don't like selling is because they don't like salespeople. 
and they want people to like them. I said that too fast, didn't I? Uh, the reason a lot of people don't like selling is because they don't like salespeople. And they don't want other people to look at them like they look at salespeople. Because they want to keep their money and still get the stuff. Well, can't I just pay less? And so you want people to be happy to pay you, but you're resistant and irrita irritated when it's time for you to pay. I'm a happy buyer. I love to pay people. I love to pay the people who serve me. I can't pay them fast enough. Why? Because the scripture says, if you got it by you, don't make the person wait to pay them. Don't say go and come back in tomorrow when you have it by you. Because it makes you feel powerful to make people wait. I'm, no, you, you don't understand. Everything reproduces after its own kind. The reason you don't attract people who are happy to pay you, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were happy to pay somebody? I mean, got excited about it. Oh, let me pay. I can't wait to pay. This was so good. I can't hardly wait to pay you. Right? Here's why. Because we've been programmed to love the money and use the people. And we would be so much better off and our business would be better off and the world would be better off if we would love the people and use the money. And it would even be better if we learned to use the money to love the people. I give somebody a tip. I go to a restaurant, I give them a tip. That tip might make their day. Tomorrow, I won't even remember I gave it to them. So I'm not just going to throw a dollar on the table, or like a lot of Christians do on Sunday afternoon, go eat all the food at the all you can eat. <laughs> they, but you said, it said all you can eat. I eat all of it. <laughs> and then in lieu, of a tra in lieu of a tip, they leave a gospel track. If you ain't going to leave a tip, please don't leave a track. You're misrepresenting. Okay, anyway. So pay the price. Be a happy buyer. I'm, I can do this. I can be a happy buyer. Like when it's my turn to pay, I'm happy to buy. I'm not, I'm not lamenting the price of gas. I'm not lamenting the price of electricity. I'm not, and I know what you are thinking. I know what you are thinking because I'm a mind reader. You are thinking, yeah, well, if I had your money, I wouldn't lament it either. Well, see, but you don't understand. I didn't lament it. That's how I got my money. Yeah. See, what you think is the, res is the cause is actually the result. Because the root always comes before the fruit. Yeah. Root first, root first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So he paid the price. What does it say? Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings upon the altar. What's, the, what's a burnt offering a picture of? A burnt offering is a picture of total sacrifice. What's sacrifice? Okay, get this now. Get this now. Sacrifice, most people think sacrifice is relinquishing something I'd rather hold on to. Right? Here's what sacrifice is. Letting go of something of a lower nature so you can take a hold of something of a higher nature. That's sacrifice. Letting go of right now so you can take a hold of later on. Sacrificing the immediate on the altar of the long term. Sacrificing the temporal on the altar of the eternal instead of the other way around. Okay, cool. So... Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings and right at, upon the altar, that was verse four, right after that it says, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God said, ask what I shall give thee. Now I'm gonna tell you something. I know for, I can't speak for you, but me, I would love to have that. God, wake up. Yes, Lord, what is it? I got a blank check up here with your name on it. How much you want me to make it out for? I'm going to give you, I am the God of the universe who made everything out of nothing. I'm going to give you anything you want. What would you like? Let me ask you a question. Before I tell you what his answer was, let me ask you a question. What would your answer be? Ooh, I'd like one of these and two of those, three in green, four in blue, two yellow. Um, can you give me a minute? I got to go check my list, right? Right? That's not what Solomon said. You know why? Because Solomon understood what success was, doing the thing you were created for. And the prayer that Solomon prayed changed everything. I believe if we, as people who have a desire 
to be blessed, to be a blessing, if we begin to pray this prayer, not recite the words, but to pray this prayer to make us our heart's desire so that when we wake up in the morning, we're thinking about it. As we go through our day, we're thinking about it. When we go to bed, we're thinking about it. The so- prayer that Solomon prayed, he said, that's what I shall give thee. Solomon didn't ask, he didn't ask for the stuff we would ask for. Here's what he says, he, here's what he said, here's what he said. Um, and Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant understanding to, uh, an understanding heart to discern uh, to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great people? Let me ask you something. If God came to you and said, I got something, I'll give you anything you want, would you ask for the ability to discern between right and wrong? <laughs> Just give me the ability to know what's right and know what's wrong. Like, if, if, if you were sitting beside Solomon and God was talking to him, not you, and you say, bro, come on, bro, you can do better than that. Right? But here's what Solomon realized. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I get if I live my life for something other than the thing I was created for. It doesn't matter. It's not that it doesn't matter that much. It doesn't matter at all. He said, he said, he said did you notice that he said, I'm a little child, I know not how to go out nor to come in. What if, how many of y'all have ever felt underqualified, unqualified, or disqualified for the thing you put, like, you're, that you're focused on. Like, I don't even know how to do this thing. Right. Well, what if that were one of the qualifications? Because that, that was one of Solomon's qualifications. God gave him a job that he wasn't ready for. He said, I'm a little child. I don't know how to do you, The thing you put me here to do, I don't know how to do it. If every father who's ever fathered a child were to be honest, they would say, I don't know how to be a father. If every mother who's ever given birth, given birth to a child were to be honest, they would say, I don't know how to be a mother. Same is true for brothers, sisters, sons, teachers. Like, I don't know how to do this thing. So maybe, maybe this, is, maybe this prayer is one of the most important prayers that's ever been prayed. Here's what he said. Dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. Solomon's prayer shows that Solomon was aware. Aware of what? He was aware of the fact that he was put here to please God. And he was aware of the fact that he was put here to serve people. Wait, but Solomon, you don't understand, you're the king, I know. I am the king who was put here to serve the people righteous judgment. That's my job. Are y'all tracking? I know, y'all are like, when are you going to get to the money part? I'm already in it. I'm going to give you the steps in a minute. I'm going to give you the money steps in a minute. But like, you, don't even, like, you, you think you just want to get to the money, but, and then you're going to go blow it. So I'm going to do the, the way I know how to do it. What if every morning when I woke up, I said, dear Lord, give me the wisdom of the day to be the father you put me here to be in a way that pleases you and serves these children you've given me to serve? What if every day when I woke up, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do. do give me the wisdom to be the husband you put me here to be in a way that, ple- please, uh, that pleases you and serves this wife you've given me to serve. What if every day when I get, before I came here, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to be the teacher, coach, mentor, Bible teacher, whatever, that you put me here to be in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. What if, what if instead of just going for the money, yeah. what if, what if my real heart's desire And my real passion was pleasing God and serving people. What would that turn into? Well, I don't know what it's going to turn into for you, but I know what it's turned in for me since 2014. A whole bunch. And I realize still today, I'm not the reason. 
Because I'm just as much a little child now as I was in 2014. And I don't know how to go out anymore or come in anymore now. And so I got to make sure I understand that just like Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. I'm an extension. Even, Even as a human being, I'm an extension of God. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion. Over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. Like, I am an extension of God. I am to represent him. I am to, I'm to show other people who don't know him how he moves and how he operates. And the effect of him on the life of a human. And so, Solomon prayed this prayer. Like, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. It will change your life. It's way better. That's way bigger than the money. The money's fine. I, I ain't mad at the money. Some people say, I don't care about the money. You'll never hear me tell that lie. Because every time I hear somebody say, I don't care about the money, I don't, you'll, you'll lie about that, you'll lie about other stuff. <laughs> now, I don't care the most about the money. But anybody who's, anybody who's working on anything that gets compensated, who says, I don't care about the money, you are lying. Anyway. You think you're being honest, you think you're being humble, but you're just lying. Okay, so, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves um, serves the people you put me here to serve. So, determine who you, what kind of person you will be. Discover what your purpose is. So, this is so cool. What is your purpose? I love the fact that God is a God of goodness and mercy and love. He's also a God of righteousness and judgment. But God is a God of goodness and mercy. And here's what's cool. What's cool is that he has made me and you and all of us. He's, I'm going to make that a little smaller. He's, he's given all of us a passion for a thing. Okay. And what's interesting is the stuff I'm passionate about you're not necessarily passionate about, right? So, so you have, I've got a passion, you've got a passion, okay? But also, oops, also you have a thing that's not a marker, okay? So you have, um, also, we have a proficiency. We have a proficiency, something we're good at. This is something that I love to do This is something that I'm good at. If you are a person who loves God and you're yielded to him and willing to do, here's what's fascinating. You can't find your purpose with an agenda. Did I say that too fast? If you have an agenda, you can't find purpose. Why? Because you have to be yielded to the the purpose for your life before you figure out what it is or you can't figure out what it is. Why? Because as human beings, we don't believe what's true. We take the things that we think are true. I'm I'm sorry, we take the things that we believe and then we act as if they're true. And so what we have to do is we have to find the truth first. We don't start with our beliefs, we start with the truth. Are you tracking? And so here's what's interesting. My purpose is going to be right there. Why? Because that's how good God is. He put something in me that I'm good at that you may not be good at. Something in you that you're good at that I may not be good at. Something that I love to do that I love to do that you don't love to do. Something you love to do I don't love to do. And guess what? It's all good because God made us interdependent. He made you good at what I'm bad at so I would need you. He made me good at what you're bad at so you would need me. He made all of us bad at something and so we would most of all realize that we need him. Are y'all tracking? And so, so here's what it says. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee what? The desires of thine heart. See, here's what most people think that means. Most people think that means if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you what your heart desires. But that's not what it says. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you what to desire. And when he gives you what to desire, then he gives you what you desire. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 5, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and if we we know that he heareth, 
heareth us, we know that we already have the position that we desired of him. Why? He gave us what to desire before he gives us what we desire. But see, you think you can resist what God desires you to desire and desire your own thing, and then God's going to give you that. God is not Santa Claus. Neither is Santa Claus. Okay. So anyway. Okay. All right. So this is where you find your purpose. So you discover your purpose. Like, let me ask you a question, honestly. You don't have to answer me. Just think in your heart. In your, in, when was the last time you took inventory of your gifts? Like, what did, when was the last time you sat down and, like, literally, number one, I'm good at this. Number two, I'm good at this. Number three, I'm good at this. And then, number one, I'm, I love this, and I love this, and I love this. I wonder where these two things align. Where do they intersect? When was the last time you did that? Maybe that's why you're confused. Because you think you're going to find your purpose in something that somebody else is good at that you admire. But God didn't put you here to be them. They're already doing that. He put you here to be you. And there's nobody doing that until you start doing it. Okay, y'all tracking. Okay, discover um, your purpose and then dedicate yourself to that purpose. So I know, so I'm, I'm gonna give you an example. I love to learn about what? Unfortunately, just about everything. <laughs> Right, everything is fascinating to me. I'm the most easily fascinated human there is. I, well, there's another squirrel. Okay, so, <laughs> right, right, and so, so, so I love to learn. Hmm. But when I learn something, I love to share it. Huh. I'm really good at thinking about complex things over a very long period of time, so that when I communicate them. They seem simplified. Ah, maybe I should be a teacher. <laughs> Are y'all tracking? Right? Now, I'm athletic, and I like basketball, but I'm probably not going to try out for the NBA. It's just probably not, not in the guard. not going to happen. I'm not going to do it. Why? It's not my proficiency, and it's not my greatest passion. I love golf some days. Oh, I love golf on the days it loves me back. <laughs> okay? But Tiger Woods, I am not, nor will I be. I don't, have, I don't have any desire to dedicate that level of time to that game. I'm really, I was wondering, what's wrong right now? I am really like cooking off the bone right now. So if somebody can cool it off in here, that'd be awesome. Okay. <laughs> I'm like about to melt. I'm like something's wrong and it just hit me. Okay. Um, so um, dedicate yourself to that purpose. If you're going to be a teacher, like be a student. If you want to be great at your craft, spend four to 10 times as much time preparing as you do performing. Yes. Four to 10 times as much time. Amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. Okay. And then discipline yourself in that, in that process. So what was Solomon's process? This is where I decided, okay, I'm gonna, this is going to change the game for me. Discipline yourself in the process. What was Solomon's process that made him rich? Okay, the first thing he did, and I'm, I was, I'm going to start here, because I'm getting ready to go. I'm we're leaving for Atlanta, and then I'm going to be doing a conference there, um, Content, Creation, Content Creation Academy, Content Creation Academy Live, CCA Live. I'm going to be teaching the people stuff for the next phase. Well, it's really interesting. Regardless of what business you're in, would y'all like me to share with you the ultimate leverage for like crazy amounts of profitability without having to pull a whole bunch of money out of your pocket? Everybody want to know that? Okay, here it is. Go manufacture some fame. Okay, okay, y'all are looking at me like I said something crazy. Okay, you go manufacture fame, but you don't manufacture fame by manufacturing fame. You manufacture fame by finding people with big mouths and serving them well. Okay, here's what it says, 1 Kings chapter four, verse number 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much. How much? Exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. 
And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. And I always see this in parentheses in there. And in case you don't know what that means, <laughs> right? He was wiser than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Haman, and Chachal, and Darda, and the sons of Mahal, and his fame, his what? Fame. His fame was in all nations round about. Huh, isn't that interesting? How many of y'all never saw that before? His fame was in all nations round about. Now watch this. How did his fame get in all nations round about? Well, here's what it says in verse 32. He spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even the hyssop that springeth forth out of the wall. And he spake of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. There's a reason. Okay, before I go into this, understand this. There's a reason the Bible is going into this much detail about what he did. It could have just said he wrote 3,000 proverbs and songs were 1,005, and that could have been it. Then it starts telling us the subject matter. Does that not make you wonder why? I know it's something I think, what does now? Okay, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But why is he saying this? And there, then it says, and there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all, the, from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. This is so powerful. So Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs about what? Trees and animals and insects? Now I'm really confused. This doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Does it? It doesn't seem to, but it makes the most sense. Why? What is Solomon doing? First of all, Solomon started creating content that could go to places he was not. This is before Facebook, this is before Instagram, this is before YouTube, this is before Twitter, this is before X, this is before Threads, this is before LinkedIn. Solomon started putting his ideas on paper and putting it out there in the marketplace for it to impact people. And they were like, oh my goodness, you never saw anything like this before. And his content went viral. And, and I know that sounds funny because that's the terminology we use, but wait a minute, how much harder how much harder was it for Solomon's content to go viral than for ours? They didn't have social, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have television, radio, newspaper. But the scripture says, this is, I didn't put it in here. It says, it says, there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. Now, I'm going to show you how this worked in a minute. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. It, well, maybe it won't. It blew my mind. My mind's probably more easily blown. But, Solomon created content. Uh, so I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to go look at your Instagram and see if you have 1,005 posts. See, you're not even diligent enough to do it when it's easy. That's real, ain't it? Like, we got all these platforms that can multiply our presence and magnify and amplify our presence, and we're not using any of them. I just don't like social media. It doesn't matter. They like it. Yes. You ain't serving you. Okay, but wait, but wait, there's more. Go look at your YouTube. You know what fascinates me? Like, people want to come on my YouTube channel, and you're welcome to do it, by the way. I love you. Do your thing. I ain't mad at you. They come on my YouTube channel, and they will do it, an entire comment lopedia about why I'm wrong on a video. And I'm, I don't mind that. I, I, I already know there's at least a 50% chance I'm wrong. <laughs> but they do a whole comment, comment lopedia. What's a comment lopedia? It's a comment that's as long as an encyclopedia. And they want to give me all the reasons I'm wrong. And they want to protect all the people who came to hear me from me. And then I go to their YouTube channel, and they've been on for 17 years, got two videos and six subscribers. Which tells me, you don't care about what you're pretending to believe, you just care about being right. So I'm going to let you be right. Are y'all tracking? By the way, those comment Lapedia people, some of you have let them stop you from posting content. They ain't, the only place they post this stuff is comments on your stuff because they don't, they, don't they don't even have enough wherewithal or desire or design to just create something to put out there. They're just going around judging everybody else's content. And you're letting that person stop you? 
Wow, I can't believe it's this late already. Okay, because I'll show you how to 10x your income. Okay, so here's the thing about Solomon's content. Here's, here's the thing about Solomon's content that was amazing. Y'all ready? He talked about trees and animals and insects. What does that mean? Solomon pulled uncommon lessons from common places. Who could do that? Any of us? If we cared enough. Are y'all tracking? Okay. So let's go look at the business model, the 10x my income, and who knows how many x Solomon is. If Solomon were alive today, he would be worth trillions of dollars. Okay. So, 1 Kings chapter 10, and I've got to go fast because I took too long on the first part. Well, whatever too long is. Okay. And when the queen of Sheba had heard the fame of Solomon and the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train and camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. So the first thing we see about King Solomon's business model, this is, how, this is the process that Solomon disciplined himself in. God gave Solomon the wisdom to run a kingdom. But he also gave Solomon the wisdom to consult with other kings. He was a consultant to his contemporaries. And I said, I can do that. If you're good at something, now if you're not good at it, then probably you shouldn't consult. But if you're good at something, it might be a good idea for you to consult with other people who want to be good at that thing and teach them your methodology. <sighs> it's in the Bible. You're good at doing a thing that other people would love to know, but you're not teaching them. Okay, cool. So he was a consultant to his contemporaries. The queen of Sheba was a monarch. She was the queen of, of Sheba. Okay, now, here's what it says. When the queen of Sheba, verse four, had seen Solomon's wisdom in the house that he built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servant, and the attendance of his ministers in, her, in their apparel, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. He took her breath away. And she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Wait a minute. She was in her own land and she heard of Solomon's acts and his wisdom. See, you want to go find people. Solomon put out enough content that people could find him. Real talk. But she didn't believe it. She said, Howbeit, I believe not the words, verse 7, until I came and mine eyes have seen, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and thy prosperity, thy wisdom and thy prosperity, thy wisdom and thy prosperity. Oh, there's, that's a Bible word, prosperity. Who knew? I thought prosperity was only a word that people who, anyway. Thy wisdom and thy prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. You know what that means? Solomon was better at his job than his reputation told. His wisdom preceded him. His, his prosperity preceded him, but it did not exceed him. You know why people don't want to follow you? Sometimes because your wisdom precedes you and then it exceeds you. In other words, the story about you is greater than the experience of you. Right? Yeah, you're a mile wide, but you're only an inch deep on your subject. And then she said, Happy are these thy men, happy are these thy servants to stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Let me ask you a question. Can people see that God loves the people that you were sent to serve because of how you serve them? Isn't that a great question? Can God see, can other people from the outside looking in, can they tell that God loves the people you were sent to serve because of how you serve them? God loved, this is what the Queen of Sheba said, God loved Israel forever, therefore sent he, therefore made he the king to be judgment, do judgment and, judgment and justice. In other words, one of the ways God loves, God loves people is by sending us to serve them. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to go through this really fast. 120 talents of gold. You can go do the math later. I'm just going to tell you about how much it was. A talent of gold weighed somewhere between 68 and 74 pounds, depending on what country it was from. If we say 70 pounds, there's 16 ounces in a pound. So if we take 70 times 16, and then we multiply that 
times 120 because that's how many talents of gold she brought. And then we multiply that times the current price of gold. It's going to be somewhere between 250 and 270 million dollars in today's dollars that one client paid him. And you thought you had a high ticket offer. <laughs> Myron, why do you charge so much? Why do you charge $40,000 an hour? I don't know. I'm consulting my contemporaries. I just, I charge them kingly rates. Myron, how can you charge somebody $350,000 for a day with you? Well, just, Bible. <laughs> At least it ain't $250 million yet. Are y'all tracking? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't conjure all this stuff up out of the ethers. I didn't make it up. I found it. Okay, y'all tracking. So, but that wasn't even all she brought. Um, 120 talents of gold and spices of great store and precious stones. There came no such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. It could have been, it could have been three or four hundred million dollars worth of goods that this one client paid him. Okay, you are tracking. So King Solomon was a consultant to his contemporaries. You want to 10x your income? Become a consultant to your contemporaries. Find people who are in the business you are in and their business isn't doing as good as yours and teach them how to do it better. When I started, I was in multi-level marketing. I didn't want to do multi-level marketing anymore, but I was good at it. So you know what I did? I started consulting with multi-level marketing, creating courses for them, creating coaching programs for them, and I sold them those programs. Their business did better. They kept, kept bringing me into the, they bring me into their organizations, and the companies would bring me, and I just kept doing the same thing over and over. Okay, you are tracking. All right, now, we're going to go down a, little far, um, down a little farther to verse number 23, just for sake of time. So Solomon, King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Oh, there it is again. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear the wisdom which God had put in his heart. Okay, all the earth sought to Solomon. Now we read in verse chapter four, at the end of chapter four, that all the kings of the earth sent their people because all the kings of the earth came to Solomon and paid him to learn his wisdom. Go read 2 Chronicles chapter nine. All the kings of the earth came to Solomon and learned his wisdom. Then they went back and sent their people to learn his wisdom so that when, their people, when they started running their kingdom like Solomon ran his, the people would revolt. So now all the kings of the earth are paying him and now they're sending all their people. Guess what? When you're really good at what you do, other people who are in the business you are in will send people to you and you will literally have no competition. What? And even if they don't send them, if you're really good at what you do, other people are going to be, see people that you've coached and you've taught and you've mentored and they're going to say, I want to learn from who they learned from. I'm, I'm, it's it's in, like... If, you can't even begin to imagine how well this works until you start doing it. Okay, so Solomon was not only a consultant to his contemporaries, but he was also a communicator to crowds. If everybody on earth came to Solomon to hear his wisdom, there's no way they came to him one at a time. He put them together in groups. And he did seminars on wisdom and living life and life skills. And guess what? He charged them for it. And not only that, also he didn't just charge them once. So that's the third part of his business model. It says, in verse 25, and they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold, and garments and armor and spices and horses and mules, a rate year by year. Solomon was the king of continuity cash flow. He said, I'm going to sell it once, but you've got to pay me for it every year. And they came back and renewed every year. So I said, I am going to consult my contemporaries. I'm going to communicate to crowds. And I am going to have continuity programs so people can buy it once and pay for it from now on. We've got, we've got a $55,000 coaching program that we have people who've been in it for four years. We've got a $350,000 VIP day plus. We've got people who are in their second year. Why? Because it's in the Bible. You want a 10x your income? Go study King Solomon's business model. And every time you see something in it, you implement it. I, ch I dare you to come back and show me it doesn't work. I dare you, because you can't, because it works. I hope this blesses you beyond your wildest imaginations and sets your family free financially. So go be blessed by the best and do these things that we share with you today and may your life be blessed. Bye for now.